While Shane Fitzsimmons led his volunteer bushfire brigades through a horror summer of raging bushfires, he also led the nation by telling us which disasters were ensuing and how his crews were planning on winning each battle. But how do you do all of that while suffering the loss of six of your own men and then face their families afterwards to offer heartfelt condolences? Who is this man? Shane Fitzsimmons, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, g'day, Chris. How are you? I'm very, very well. But we knew it would be a bad summer. We knew about the bushfires. We knew how dry it was because of the drought. But boy, oh boy, it was mammoth, wasn't it? Oh, it, it was beyond what we were, we were, we were predicting. And, and we even predicted a bad season last year, but we just didn't get the, the weather elements coming together. We didn't get the number of ignitions. And I think we cannot overstate how critical the drought was this season. So the drought had built over the last couple of years. Uh, you, you, you couple that with the worst ever fire weather conditions we've experienced here in New South Wales, particularly across our most populated area. And what ended up unfolding was an unprecedented set of circumstances uh, in New South Wales history. So uh, the area burnt along the Great Dividing Range, the number of lives lost, the number of homes destroyed, and the longevity of the campaign, remembering mm. that up in Region North with this drought, we were averaging more than 1,000 fires a month during winter, June, July, August. Northern New South Wales was still getting affected by fires. And then as the season went on, as we naturally came into the spring months and then the summer months, we knew the temperatures would increase. We knew the conditions would naturally worsen with the seasonality. Uh, and then we just saw you know, widespread fire of a scale we haven't seen before, stretching from the Queensland border to the Victorian border. And would it be fair to say that because of the longevity of every single fire, there were some fires there that were going hundreds of days, um, because of the longevity and because how wild they were, it didn't matter how many volunteer bush firefighters you had? Uh, absolutely. And, and not only was it the volunteers, we had... We had all the firefighting agencies in New South Wales, the RFS, of course, Fire and Rescue, National Parks, Forestry, all the police and emergency services. Every functional area of government that's tied to emergency management was heavily involved. They were located at the State Operations Centre down in Sandy Olympic Park. They were, they were located in incident management teams right across the state. And we ended up utilising uh, every state and territory of Australia, our colleagues from New Zealand, our colleagues from the United States and Canada, uh, something like six or 7,000 extra people um, uh, coordinated through the National Resource Sharing right. Centre to come in here and help us during that awful period. It just went on for months. As I said, you've lost six men through this period. Does that shoot morale down? Does it, does it keep firefighters subdued? Or does it lift them up? Or does it do both? I think it does both. I think, I think, I think like the families, or not like the families, but... But the RFS family, we've lost our own, and, and it is absolutely gutting for everybody. Uh, you, are, you are truly grief-stricken and, and, and only second to the families. And as we saw with these six individuals, three volunteer firefighters and three aviators from the United States working in Bomber 134 down the south coast, but those three wonderful young men, um, as I've said a, a number of occasions, they died as heroes, uh, and, and we felt that not just in the RFS family, not just in the Fire and Emergency Service family, right across New South Wales and Australia, but first and foremost, our hearts were breaking uh, for the three beautiful women left behind, two little toddlers, uh, uh, and in Megan's case, a baby due only in May of this year. So it, it doesn't get more horrific than that. It doesn't get more tragic than that, uh, particularly when you put the overlay on that these men were giving of themselves for the want of nothing in return but to try and make a difference in their local community and communities much further afield, uh, trying to save life and protect property. It's, but Shane, it's what tragic. I witnessed also was after the initial grief period, maybe just 24 hours, there were firefighters coming out of their beds after getting the first bit of sleep and getting back into the trucks. It was almost buoying their uh, determination absolutely. and courage. And, and, and I think it strengthened their resolve. And the, and, the, and the classic example is the Horsley Park Brigade itself. So Jeff and Andrew came from the Horsley Park Brigade uh, the most horrific of accidents, uh, one of two horrific accidents involving those volunteer firefighters. 
they, they really struggled in the first 24 hours. But then I spent some time with them, the Premier spent some time with them, the PM spent some time with them, family spent time with them. And what did they do? The best way to pay tribute and honour their mates, their family members, was get back out on that truck and continuing to serve and save and protect as many and as much as possible. Inspiring possibly. stuff. Extraordinary stuff. Yeah. I want inspiring. to play for our viewers a little bit of what you said in front of the press after we lost a firefighter in the Green Valley Fire. This is that clip. The firefighter that lost his life uh, was Samuel McPaul. Sam McPaul, uh, a young man, uh, 28 years of age, um, uh, well respected uh, and admired uh, throughout the local community and in his local brigade. Uh, he leaves behind, tragically, um, um, a beautiful wife, uh, Megan, uh, who is pregnant uh, with, their, with their first child uh, that's due on the 4th of May. The, um, as you would expect, uh, the family is um, grieving and it's been a very difficult night and I would be fair to say I don't even think the comprehension has set in yet at the enormity of the, of the tragedy and the loss. There was loss there for you, but there was also the connection with his wife and the fact that she was expecting. Was that the hardest part about that loss of life? It was tragic all around, Chris, and, and I think you'll find that press conference was on the morning after I'd just been able to get flown back from the accident scene and spending time with Sam's wife, Megan, and Sam's mum, Chris, uh, and um, Megan's mum, Lisa. We, we'd spent some hours in the home in the early hours of, of that morning on New Year's Eve, and, and we'd been able to get flown back uh, into Sydney, uh, and I think that was a press conference we did uh, in first thing in that morning once we got back. So, so the, the tragedy was all very raw, the conversations, the time spent with, uh, with Megan and the family was all very raw. Um, and these um, wives must be inconsolable. They're extraordinary, remarkable, beautiful, um, resilient women. Um, there, is something, there is something obviously very difficult about going to one's home uh, that's just lost their husband, just lost their, their loved one. Uh, but there is something very sacred about that. And, and I've spoken with my chaplains and my critical incident team and, and even, the, even the wives themselves, Megan, uh, Mel and Jess, and, and I'll be forever grateful for them opening that door and, and letting us come in and, and have a talk uh, and share uh, in some way uh, in their darkest of hours um, um, what, what Sam was like, what Jeff was like, what Andrew was like uh, and have some difficult conversations about what might come next. And, and to me, uh, they will be uh, remembered always as some of the most sacred uh, and special times uh, albeit they were some of the most difficult and challenging but Shane, uh, that I've but, ever experienced. But what a wretched job you've got to knock on the door of someone who's just lost their husband, a young person. Absolutely, and, and the police officers that did the formal knock, knocking on the door and the notification were with us on some of those occasions still there. They're quite remarkable at what they do. Um, tragically, they do it too often to families across New South Wales. Um, but I, I, I know that in the time I spent uh, whether, whether it was with the wives, uh, whether it was the little toddlers, whether it was with mums and dads, brothers, uh, in-laws. Uh, they, were, they were truly precious, truly special times, albeit uh, awfully difficult times to have a conversation about their loved one that went out only hours ago uh, to save life, to save property, do what they love doing, do, you know, helping their community, being with their mates. And tragically, they're not coming home. Okay. They've perished in the worst of, worst of accidents. You're helping them. Who helps you? through this period? Oh, look, I've, I'm surrounded by lots of good people. My colleagues, um, I've got chaplaincy networks, the, the critical incident team, I've got Deputy Commissioner Rob Rogers, colleagues in the other agencies, but there's no doubt uh, my, my biggest support, uh, my biggest crutch is my wife, Lisa, and, and we do talk often, and, and we did speak uh, during, you know, uh, this fire season particularly, uh, and most particularly, uh, when we saw these tragedies unfold, and whether it was the first one receiving a call, just before midnight at home uh, regarding the crash involving Andrew and Sam or in the afternoon uh, when we heard about the new... Uh, Andrew and uh, Jeff, sorry, yeah. or in the afternoon involving the, the accident with Sam and, and my instinct was uh, to simply go there and be there and be present, uh, get a sense for myself what the accident scene looked like and how it might have unfolded, uh, but also uh, to catch up with colleagues, remembering 
that these accidents, there was others in the vehicles. There, mm. there were others that survived, miraculously, dare I say it, uh, in, in my observations and in conversations with them, but also others on the fire ground, others that were working with them, others that rendered first aid, as futile as it was for, uh, for the three that, that, that perished, uh, but looking after the others that did get out and did get ambulance treatment, got to hospital, um, spending time with them, and then, as I say, getting to spend time with family was, was really important and precious. I want to rewind 20 years ago, and for a lot of people, they wouldn't be aware of this. Your father was involved in a backburning operation at Mount Karingai. Mm. Tell us what happened that day. Yeah, so they were doing a hazard reduction burn up there. It was a, it was a fairly benign day. It was it, weather, weather conditions were conducive to, to prescribed burning, hazard reduction burning. Uh, the 8th of June 2000, actually. Uh, and then um, uh, Dad was working with National Parks at the stage. Um, he'd been a very long-term volunteer, but joined the joined the field crews of National Parks where he did a lot of fire trail and maintenance work, but also a lot of fire management, fire suppression, fire fighting work. And this prescribed burn, um, um, what basically happened was uh, conditions changed and to this day we still don't know exactly what happened, but they found themselves uh, going uphill from the fire, which, which is against convention, uh, and they were enveloped by fire. Uh, uh, tragically, uh, three people perished on the mountain that day, including my dad. Uh, and another fellow died a couple of months later in hospital as a result of uh, horrendous injuries. Uh, and then there were three others in that crew that survived the day uh, and continue to live uh, with the emotional and physical scars as a result of their injuries and their experience. How tough was that for you to lose your father in something that you'd been involved in since you were 15, a bushfire brigade, you started at Duffy's Forest. How hard was it to lose a father knowing that you loved what you did? It was extremely difficult, Chris, and, and, and I remember sitting through every day of that coronal inquiry with the other families, with my own family, trying to get the details. And to this day, I, I, I've said it to others, what I would just give for a five-minute conversation with my dad to know truly what happened in those last minutes, because there's so many things that just defy the fundamentals and the basics of training and procedure and extraordinary experience uh, like my dad had. So something else has happened in there mm. that I just can't put my finger on. And, and there's no doubt, uh, for, for, for a moment there, uh, I really felt like giving the whole game away because I thought if, if this can happen to my old man with his experience, with his knowledge, and, and I'd been on many fire grounds over the years with him and learnt a lot from him and so did so many others, and, and he was regarded as one of the best, there's no doubt about it. And, but then I thought about it a little bit more and, 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 and in, if in a prescribed burn and a hazard reduction burn where things are benign, yet things can go horribly wrong, deadly wrong, uh, then there's no point being on the periphery, there's no point stepping away uh, and being one of those people on the sideline that pontificate and offer all this opinion, you know, uh, removed from what's happening. Oh. Uh, and, it, and in a way, it just strengthened my resolve to continue to try and make a difference, make things safer, make things better for everybody. I, I, I find that remarkable. I understand how much you would have considered giving it away because you wind back six years before you lost your dad. It was 1994. You yourself were in a position that if it weren't for the topography of where you were, you too could have lost your life. We'll have a listen to that audio of you in a terrible situation in 94. Hey, so I've just tried to depart Lower Road. The road out is impassable. There is Beacon 1 and myself located at the end of Lower Road. Uh, copy. Roger, there's two fronts moving towards us. Yeah, how's your welfare down there? At this stage, uh, you know where that rock shelf was on the left. I've got all vehicles as far south on that rock shelf as I can. Right, uh, we are trapped. Thank goodness for the rock shelf. It was, and, and if you go back to basic training in firefighting, uh, we, 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 the trucks had run out of water so we couldn't activate sprinkler systems. So the best thing we were looking for was a cleared space, a, a defendable space where we would just have to put up with the radiant heat and the... And, and what that meant for the fire truck. So we, we, we sheltered as far away from the approaching fire front as we could uh, in, the, in the open rock shelf area. We parked up the vehicles and then we sheltered inside of the vehicles to withstand the heat. And whilst the vehicles suffered some, some melted components and things like that, they were OK, we were OK. Uh, and it was only a little while later uh, that we were able to get back out and re-engage in firefighting. But in the middle of that, you must have thought, even for a millisecond, that you were about to face your maker. Oh, you do. You, that, go, that thought goes through your mind, but, 
but I think at the same time you're, you're acutely aware of what's going on around you so you can act in accordance with what's, with what's unfolding and, and you know there are signals, we always talk about it and, and um, you know if, if, if the vehicles start catching a light and things start burning you know you've got cleared space around you so, so if, if, if that starts to fail you then you can get out and you know with your protective clothing, with your gloves on and those sorts of things you can then take shelter close to the ground on the road. So, so all those sorts of processes were going through my mind and I'm sure that was going through my colleagues that were there. But as it turns out, Chris, thank goodness, uh, it didn't turn out as bad as it, it, it could have been. And thank goodness for the service as well. And thank goodness, I think, for Australians to be able to have you in the position you are now. But that may not have happened because at one stage you were a grease monkey. You were a motor mechanic. You could have stayed a motor mechanic. Oh, look, it's fair to say, I think all my colleagues that I did my trade with, uh, that I was in the floor with, I wasn't a very good motor mechanic. I'm still <laughs> not a very good motor mechanic. Uh, but I was surrounded by some really wonderful people. And, and even, even when I was doing my motor mechanics trade and when I worked in the service industry, I think all up for about a decade, I was really well supported by my employers. I, I started out with a Holden dealership and then I was at a, another dealership down on the northern beaches. And even with all my volunteering and even with all the firefighting, they were very supportive about releasing me away from work for the right. time when the big fires were on. So whether it was big fires or whether it was big storm events, they were really community-minded. And, and like everything, if it's a two-way street. If, if you're a good employee, I think, and you put in the hard yards, then they're willing to give you a bit of slack and give you a few days off here and there when the fires were on. So I was always connected to the service as a volunteer. I loved it. I thrived in the camaraderie, the training, the, the operations, the sense of community service. And, and fortunately, um, um, after a few years in the motor industry, in the, in the mid-90s, early 90s, uh, September 94, as a matter of fact, I was able to secure my first full-time job with the service, and I've kind of been there ever since. You've kind of been there ever since, and then some.